Hello, my dear students, and welcome again in a, in a new chapter with our electronic stream module. In the previous chapter, we have to demonstrated together the main concepts of the outstage power amplifier, going through the three main categories, class A, class B, and class A, A B. Of course, this topic can be wider and wider, and you can visit Cedra for that concerning class C power amplifiers or maybe class D power amplifiers. And also we have highlighted the utilization of MOSFETs as well in the process of outstage power amplifiers. However, again, a deeper look can be considered. Now we will going to turn to the next chapter in our course uh, dealing with analog filters. So in this chapter, we are going to analyze how you can construct an IC-based analog filter. And maybe we will answer the question, what is the difference between considering analog filters in general and IC-based analog filters? I believe that most of you have already uh, studied somehow the word filters before either uh, from an electronics perspective using these standard uh, LC, RLC, or RL filters. And also from a communication perspective, definitely you have considered using different types of filter while you are studying your uh, analog or digital modulation courses. So herein we are going to discuss the same head topic, but with, with a different perspective from a pure electronic perspective. So let's start now considering this point, which is filter design, analog filter design, and tuned amplifiers. Okay, so we are still using Cedra microelectronics reference. Here you can visit chapter 17. Again, please take care of your version because most likely you will find this chapter in all the versions or all the editions, but with different orders. So just make sure which version you are using, but most likely it will have the same uh, title with, uh, uh, sorry, with uh, filters and the tuned amplifiers. So you can easily pick up the chapter, whatever your edition is. Okay, so let's start the process. I think maybe one year, two years ago, you have introduced the concept of filters. And I believe that maybe the most fundamental filter you see is this typical LC filter. If you remember this LC filter, this is a process of a filtering, pro a filtering process. So let's see how this is considered as a filtering process. So uh, I will now turn to my whiteboard. Yes. And let's stop sharing for a while and see how LC or just re revise or flash back how LC are considered. So basically, <clears throat> I'm just okay. So, I need to so basically, when we have a LC filter. something like that. So this is with an equivalent of a J omega L, and this is of an equivalent of J omega C, one over J omega C. So when you consider the relation between the input and the output in such a filter, you can just say that this is V input and this is V output. So simply speaking, as you can see, V output equals to, one over j omega c over j omega l plus one over j omega c times v in. This is what we call the transfer function or the function relating the output of your circuit with the input of your circuit. Just for simplification, you can multiply this by j omega c so that you get one over one minus, because j times j, j squared, which is 
minus one omega square R C. So this is basically how this function look like, which is of course a relation between V out and V in. So if you try to plot this relation, Okay, so if you try to plot this relation, which is V out equals one over one minus omega square RC times V in versus omega, you will find this is an omega axis and this is V output over V input. So with an omega equals to zero, which represents a DC component, this term will t returns to be zero and then the output is one. The higher the omega, the higher the denominator, so the lower the value. So if this, when this omega tends to infinity, this ratio will tend to zero. So we will find something like that. Or basically what we call a low pass filter, because simply this circuit, as you can see, it pass only low frequency component a, a, a bandwidth called omega C, or if you remember this cutoff frequency, and after that, it rejects high frequency component. That's why we will call this what we can call as a low pass filter. So, this is basically how we consider the process of a low pass filter. I think you already have seen this analysis maybe more than one time before. So the basic concept of, of filters was already understood by electronics researchers long time ago using these LC-based circuits. And you can design different types of so, so, uh, different types of filters using this LC filter. And you will get something like that, which represents the response for a low-pass filter or whatever filter is. However, with the developing of technology, people have upgraded the electronics structure from being what we can call a discrete electronic circuits to what we call integrated circuits or ICs. And as you know, the IC technology, or mainly the CMOS technology, is a technology based on uh, transistor concepts. So the implementation of such bulky devices, such as conductors or capacitor, considered somehow a challenge. And usually, we call this an off-chip component. So just if you just open your computer motherboard or any type of a, 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 a circuit, you will find these capacitors uh, 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 integrated in the circuit of a chip, a discrete capacitor in the board. I think all of you see this, uh, uh, this shape before or these capacitors integrated uh, outside an IC, for example, the processor or whatever. So, in this case, we are going toward what we call an inductor-less filters. So when we consider filters for IC technology, the main challenge is not to make a filter because we already have the know-how for a filter. The main challenge here is how to make filters without an inductor or an inductor-less filters. And this will be somehow the target of our chapter, or let me say the first portion of our chapter. So let's go on. So generally speaking, filters are full port na network or full port circuit with two, two, two terminals for the input and two terminals for output. You can write uh, what we can call a transfer equation, which is similar to that what we just write now, linking the output to the input. Though, so we can con uh, uh, consider this as an output over an input. Here, I just need to make sure that you understand the 
concept of the S domain, simply speaking, this S represents J omega. So when we write V output of S over V input of S, it's typically as we are writing V out of J omega over V uh, input of J omega. So the S domain is just representing the J, J omega or the omega domain. So just don't confuse between uh, using S or using J omega. So in general, this transfer function, as far as its function in omega, so you can find a magnitude and a phase, because as you know, if the omega domain is an imaginary domain, so generally speaking, you can find a magnitude for the transfer function and a phase for this transfer function. And you can write this, and also here you can determine what we can call the gain of our system, which is simply 10 log t, as you know, I think you already know that, that uh, whenever you are considering any parameter in a DP, you can say it's 10 log power or 20 log voltage. So as here, the transfer function is given in voltage, as you can see. So if you consider two power, you are just squaring this. So this square will go down and to be multiplied by 10, make it 20. So the gain in DP is 20 log the transfer function as a magnitude, simply speaking. So, as also you know, we can define four main types of filters. The most familiar or the, the most famous one, which we already considered in the beginning of the lecture, was the low pass filter, which means that we are passing only low frequency component and we are neglecting or rejecting high frequency component. Alternatively, we can have a high pass filter, which pass only high frequency components and they, and get rid of the low frequency components. And we can have what's called a band pass filter, which is also very use, usable and very in many applications, in many tunable applications. So you are just passing a certain band of frequencies and neglect or reject other bands. And finally, you can have that other version, which is that band stop filters where you just stop one frequency band and pass otherwise any other frequencies. However, all these transfer functions for these four types of filters are somehow considered as uh, ideal filters. Why we are considering this as an ideal filters? You can return back, my dear students, to your communication context to understand this. Because you know that in order to have a sharp edge in uh, one domain, that's mean you, that means that you have an infinite number of harmonics in the other domain, which is a basic theory of Fourier series. So typically speaking, it is impossible to implement such sharp edges in either time domain or over frequency domain, because simply there is nothing called an infinite harmonics, either in time or frequency. In, uh, in other words, any signal is a limited signal. Any physical signal is a limited signal. So as far as the signal is limited, it, its frequency response will not be a sharp response. So our, our non-ideal or our uh, uh, commercial or industrial or electronic based filter will not look like that. It will somehow look like that. So this is actually the difference between what we consider an ideal characteristic for a low pass filter and what we can consider as a real or a physical characteristics for a low pass filter. So let's now try to Grab the differences between this ideal response and this real or physical response. So first of all, this is the pass band where these are the frequencies you will permit to pass out of your out of your filter. And in this pass band, you can see that we still have what's called a ripples. So it's not a smooth constant factor, no, it's a rippling factor, which means that not all the frequencies in the pass pan will see the same gain. However, it, this gain will be somehow fluctuating based on the ripples you will see in the pass band. On the other hand, we have a stop band, but as also you can see, 
this stop band is not a typical zero band. I mean, it's not directly multiplying the signal by zero. However, there is only two zeros here, as you can see, but you still have ripples in the uh, pause band, in the stop band, sorry. And in between, we have what's called a sensitivity factor. So it's not a sharp edge. It's not a sharp in, in, immediate transition from the pass band to the stop band. However, it's a sloping edge with intermediate points. We call them omega p and omega s, which is the boundaries between the pass band and the stop band. So you can here understand that it's not a, uh, sorry, it's not, it's not a direct transition from the stop band to the pass band. However, it's a smooth transition. As you can see, we have what's called an A maximum, which represents the variation in the, or the maximum variation in ripples in the pass band. And we have what's called an A minimum, which represents the variation from the top level of a bounce band to a top level of a stop band, what we call an A minimum. Ideally speaking, you need A maximum to be zero so that you don't have any ripples in the pass band. And you need A minimum to P maximum so that you have a maximum distinguish between these two levels between, so if this, down to zero, so simply your A minimum will be maximum, maximized. So this is how an ideal filter looks like. So we have a stop band ripples, we have a pause band ripples, and we have a transition between omega p and omega s. So this is a, a low pass filter, and typically the same you can find it in a pause band, in a, sorry, a, a, a band pass filter still it's not as you see in the ideal case so as you can see you have zeros here and you have also some ripples here and some ripples here so this is the idea this is a physical characteristics which totally differ with respect to the um, ideal characteristics we you see le, before in the previous slide so now we are going to consider a filter. And as we can see, in order to consider, of course, we are going to consider a physical filter, not an ideal filter. So in order to consider this physical filter, you have to consider mainly the transition, the, the, the transfer characteristics. So these graphs, as you can see in the frequency domain or in the omega domain, or maybe you can say in the S domain, all represent the same mean. So this, uh, figures or these uh, sketches is simply the geometrical or the graphical representation of the transfer characteristics. So the, the key point here is to have the transfer characteristics, which is simply V output over J omega over V input over J omega of J omega, which is will be something like that, or in this sketch. As you can see, it's a fractional function between the input and the output and its function in S or function in J omega. So we can write it in this way as a factorization of some sort of roots. In case you have an S equals to any value of these numerator roots, that's basically mean that your transfer function will tend to zero. That's why we call this the roots of the numerator as the zeros, which simply represents the point at which your transfer function will tend to zero. So for example, if you remember in the low pass filter case, we call these points as omega z1 and, or omega z1 and omega z2 or omega z1 and omega z2, because at these two points, your numerator will tend to zero, which means that your transfer function overall will tend to zero. On the other hand, if one of the roots of the denominator occurs, that means that your function will tend to infinity. And we call this as pools. We call this as pools. So zeros are the roots of the denominator, where function, the transfer function tends to zero, where 
poles are the roots of the denominator where the function tends to infinity. What does it mean that your transfer function tends to infinity? This is something very unusual and very unwanted in case of filters. Because simply, if your transfer function tends to infinity, that means that your input is equal to zero because anything over zero is equal to infinity or your output is equal to infinity, which is physically un uh, unexpected. So having an infinite transfer function is something not needed in a case of a filter. However, a few weeks from now, we will force our circuits to have an infinite transfer function, but not toward having a filter, but for a totally different application when you consider oscillators. So let's keep this to the next chapter and let's uh, um, sustain in our understanding with having zeros and fours. So zeros are needed when you need to reach your transfer function to touch the x-axis or the zeros, as in the case of a stop band like here or like there. However, pools are not needed in this case. That's why when we start to plot what we can call the same sigma omega representation of the S domain, so this y axis represents the j omega axis, and this sigma represents the real part of the S, or the, we, we call it the sigma axis. As you can see, if this is a j omega, so this represents what's called sigma, which represents somehow the, the, the equivalent resistance. Because as you know, the omega term is associated with the inductance and the capacitance. So this x-axis represents the other terminal of an impedance, which is sigma. As you can see from this plot, we design our circuits so that all pools, which are represented by this x symbol here, are in the negative sigma portion. Why we did so? Because simply in your circuit, you will not have a negative resistance. So in this case, when you force your pools to be in the negative sigma axis, that simply means that you will never reach these pools because you will not, you will never physically reach to the negative sigma axis. However, for the frequency, I think you already know from your Fourier analysis that we usually make this analogy of the frequency. So we Fourier mentions that frequency are a symmetric or an even function. So when you have an, a zero here, you have a corresponding zero in the negative portion. Of course, this negative frequency has no physical meaning. And I think you already studied that from your signals uh, courses. So this negative omega has no physical meaning, but it is mathematical representation to, con to consider the omega as an even function, as you can see. So here we have two zeros with a certain value of omegas. Of course, here with a sigma equal zero, because simply there is no resistive equivalent in your filter. It's just, this is just due to the LNC, which has as an ideal zero resistance equivalent. So it's, sigma is equal to zero, and you have omega one and omega two, and you have the corresponding omega z1 and omega z2. And you force your poles here, as you can see, in to, to be in the negative sigma axis. Okay. And this, of course, is, is how the function looks like. On the other hand, and in some implementation, we have what we can call an all pool feature. As you can see, this pool, as is this filter, has no zeros because simply you have a constant in the uh, denominator. So this function will never tends to zero, but you still have some pools. And again, in order to make your system stable, you force all pools to be in the negative sigma axis so that physically it will not affect the stability of your system. This is just an introduction to consider the Definition of a transfer characteristics of a filter. And in addition, 
what is the sigma and the j omega, what is the s domain, and what is the series and what is the proof. Now, let's turn to our electronics again in order to understand the basic concept of filtering. What we are going to do now, my dear students, is we are going to study first an conventional filter, RLC filter, and then consider the equivalent IC-based filter. So let's start with this very simple RC filter. And let's start with analyzing this filter. So let's go to our whiteboard again to see how we are going to analyze this. I think you already know this analysis stuff because it's quite easy, but let's revise it back again. No problem with that. So here we have here we have our RC filter. This is orange, this is C. And as you can see from this analysis, that here we have RC filter. So simply speaking, your out your out to be out will be equals to one over J omega C over R plus. 1 over j omega c. Or simply speaking, you can simply multiply both denominator and denominator by j, uh, j omega c get to get 1 over 1 plus j omega r c. So herein, you can define the cutoff you, of your, your transistor by simply considering that this tends to one when this tends to one, because simply when this turns to one, you will have one over root two, which is uh, which represent half uh, your maximum, because your maximum is one. When when omega is equal to zero, this function will, will tends to one, which is the maximum magnitude. So the 3dB bandwidth here is defined when this omega RC equals to one, or simply when omega equals one over RC, at this point, you will reach one over one over two, two uh, or one over root two of your uh, three dB bandwidth. So, simply as you can see, let, let's go back to the uh, slides here. So, as you can see here, when omega node equals one over RC, you will have uh, your three dB bandwidth, and your DC gain. Of course, DC gain is defined when. Uh, omega is equals to uh, zero, so your DC gain is simply equals to one. So this is a very basic filter. As, as I mentioned, you already have used it and you have already analyzed it before. So how can we have a similar filter, but using our IC technology? Let's see. So what about having a circuit like that? So this is an operational amplifier. And here we have R2, R1 and R2, and we have a capacitor here. So let's now refresh back two years to our Electronics 1 courses, course when we start analyzing circuits with an operational amplifier. And let's see what will be the analysis or what will be the transfer function, the V output to the V input for this circuit. Let's see. Okay. So basically we have something like that. This is a non-invert is an inverting terminal, and this is a non-inverting terminal connected to ground. This is R1 and this is the input. And also we have a resistance here, which is R2, and a capacitor here, 
which is something like that. And of course, this is. So let's try, uh, try analyzing the circuit. But before analyzing the circuit, let's remember some basic concepts related to ideal operation amplifiers. If you remember, we have five concepts related to the ideal operation amplifiers. First, the voltage on the the, the voltage on the inverting terminal equal to the voltage on the non-inverting terminal. Second, the current the current going through the operational amplifier is equal to zero all the time. Third, the input impedance of the operational amplifier is in infinity. Fourth, the open loop gain of an operational amplifier is equal to infinity. Fifth, the output impedance of an operational amplifier is equal to zero. These are the five concepts associated with any ideal operational amplifier. So using this concept, let's start solving the problem. So simply speaking, as we mentioned, the voltage of a non-inverting terminal and the inverting terminal are equal. And as far as your positive terminal in ground is grounded, so we, we call this point, if you remember, a virtual ground or VG. So this is a virtual ground. Another important point, as the current going into the resistor, uh, into, into the operational amplifier is, is, is equal to zero, that means that simply the current going in the resistance R1 will be branched to the resistance R2 and the capacitor. So by a very simple nodal analysis, you can find that the current here equals to or the current flowing in R1 is equals to the current flowing in R2 plus the current flowing in the resistor in the capacitance. So let's now turn this into equations. So the current flowing in the resistance R1 is V input minus this point, which is grounded, so minus zero over R1. So simply it's V input over R1. The current going to the resistance R2, which is this point is still a virtual ground, so zero minus V output, because this point is, is a V output over R2, or simply it's minus V output over R2. Plus the current going into the capacitor, which is still. Not sorry, minus V output over one over J on the C. So you can say that V input over R1 equals minus V output times one over R2 plus J on the C as you can see here. Or in other words, we need V output over V input. So let's put this here. Sorry, no, we need another page. So you can say that again, let's rewrite the final equation, V input over R1 equals negative V output times <clears throat> one over R2 plus J on the C. So you can say that simply V output over V input is equal to minus one over R2 plus, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's the verse. So V out over V input equals to, so V out, so we get this in the denominator. So one over R1, the so over one over R2 plus J omega C. Simply, you can multiply pi r two in both uh, uh, in both uh, sides. Of course, here there is still negative, 
However, we don't need to worry about the negative because by the end of the day, we get the magnitude of these the output or the input. So it will be something like that. R2 over R1 over 1 plus J omega R2. So as you can see from this, we have a DC gain of R2 over R1 because simply the DC gain occurs when omega is equal to zero. So when omega equals to zero, this B will be canceled and we have R2 over R1 over one, which is typically R2 over R1. So we have an a gain equal to R2 over R1 and we have a, a 3 dB bandwidth at one over when omega equals to one over R2 C, which is typically similar to the equivalent RC folder. So let me return back here. As you can see, now this is DC gain is R2 over R1 with negative. The negative is not a big deal because you can just use it, use a buffer to return back the sign into a positive. And R2, R1 are adjustable. So you can adjust your DC gain. Even you can reach one again by putting R2 equals to R1, which is still doable. But what is important that you have typically the same cutoff frequency or the 3 dB frequency, if we consider that R and R2 are the same, so we have the same cut of frequency. So this is, as you can see, a very simple way to have a, an equivalent CMOS, uh, uh, RC, uh, uh, sorry, CMOS low-pass filter. Of course, one, one, one may ask a question about a capacitor because we still have a capacitor and a capacitor is uh, uh, an off-chip uh, device. Of course, this is true. You still need an off-chip capacitor in your, uh, in your uh, circuit, but now you have a tunable R2 over R1. And we will see, of course, this is very basic example. So later on, we will see more and more advanced circles. To you to make a, a an a, 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 an analog uh, CMOS based uh, active filter. Okay, so let's go to another example and let's consider this circuit now and see how this circuit will be behave like. So again, I will go to my uh, whiteboard and start analyzing this circuit. Now we have. A resistance R1, a capacitor R2 in series, and then we have a feedback resistance R2, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a resistance R1 and a capacitor C in series, and we have a feedback resistance, which is R2, as you can see. So let's start analyzing this circuit. Okay. So, as you can see here, we have a resistance, a capacitor connected to the inverting uh, input. The non-inverting is grounded. This is R1, this is C, and this is a resistance connected R2, as you can see here. So, again, we are going to do the same analysis. So the non-inverting and the inverting terminal have the same voltage. So simply this is the virtual gap. And then no current is going into the amplifier. So the current flowing in this branch, which is the R1 and C branch, will typically continue to R2. So it's just a one equation, one input current and one output current. So the input current will be, we have R1 and C in series. So it's R1 plus one over j omega c and the voltage across is v input force v input and this is ground so it's v input over r1 plus one over j omega c as you can see this equals to the voltage going to the r2 branch which is zero minus V output over R2 or simply minus V out over R2. So using this very simple equation, you can find that V output over V input equals 2. So we will pick this here. 
So that's right. So it's R2 with minus sign of course over R1 plus 1 over J on J6. We can write it in a easier mathematical way. So it's B alpha over B input equals minus R2 over R1 plus 1 over J omega C. Let's multiply by J omega C. Uh, sorry, let's multiply by J omega C. Yes, sir. So we have minus J omega R2 C over 1 plus J omega R1. Now, this is somehow a bit different transfer characteristics. In the previous version, we have omega only in the, in the denominator. So when I consider a DC analysis, it's very easy. I will say it's zero. Uh, this is canceled and then it's zero. But now, what about the DC gain of this? You will find that simply the DC gain here is equal to zero. This is zero and this is zero. So this is zero over one is zero. So it doesn't have a DC gain. What happened when omega increase? When omega increase, as you can see, this term becomes more and more high in value with respect to one. So you can ignore the one, leading to minus j omega R2C over j omega R1C, which will tends to R2 over R1. So simply, if you would like to plot this, it will be something like that. This is R2 over R1, and this is zero. And as you can see, this is typically what we can call a high-pass filter. Because now you are rejecting the zero, the zero frequencies or the low frequencies, and you are allowing high frequencies only. And you can easily find that your 3D bandwidth is one over R1C because when this omega equals to one over R1C, you will get one over root two over your maximum, which is R2 over R1. So this is a, another or this is another configuration where you can use operational amplifiers or what we can call an active filters to make or to implement a high pass filter. So as you can see here, your high High frequency gain is R2 over R1. And still you have a bandwidth at 1 over C R1. Okay, let's consider another example. Now we have R1 and C1 in that uh, connected between the input and the virtual ground. And we have R2 and C2 as a feedback uh, uh not, not branch or feedback circuit. So let's again go to our whiteboard in order to analyze this circuit. So let's see here. We have, as we mentioned, then we have another resistance and another resistance. So this is R1, C1, and this is R2, C2. And again, applying the same concept, this is VR, and this is VP. Again, applying the same concept, you can find that the voltage here, the voltage across this branch, sorry, the, the voltage here is virtual ground because this is grounded, so this node is virtual ground. And the current passing is R1 and C1 will go directly to R2 and C2. So in order to make the arrangements, we can say easily that V input over R1, which represents the current flowing in R1 because simply this point is grounded, plus the input over one over j omega c one equals to 
negative V out is over R2, negative V out is over 1 over V on the C2. As you can see. So what you can do now, you can get the intersection factor with 1 over R1 plus 1 over G on the C1. 1 over C1 plus 1 over 1 plus G on the C1. And we have, on the other hand, the output with negative sign of code with R2 plus one or uh, not one over J omega C2. Or in another words, we can say, let me write it again just because of my very bad handwriting. Let me write it again. So it's the input times R1, uh, sorry, me, one over R1 plus J omega C1 equal negative the output times one over R2 J omega C2. So herein, you can find the output over the input. So the output over the input equals two. So in this case, the output over the input will be equals two. One over R1 plus J omega C1 over one over R2 plus J omega C2. As you can see, my dear students. So we can make it somehow easier by multiplying by uh, R1 over, uh, or multiplying by R1 times R2, the true, so we will have R2 plus J omega C1 R1 R2 over uh, R1 plus J omega C2 uh, R1 R2. This will be the As you can see here, when omega is equal to zero, you have a DC gain, which is R2 over R1. Because when omega is equal to zero, this will cancel this term and this term, and you will have R2 over R1. And with a very, very high omega, this component will be greater than this. So you will have C1 over C2 as a gain. So herein, we have a, let me write it in a new page because this is a deserve a new page. So we have a function like that. The output of the input equals to R2 plus J omega C1 R1 R2. And R1 plus J omega C2 R1 R2. As you can see, now we have both. We have a DC gain because simply when omega is equal to zero, so R2 over R1 will happen. So we have here R2 over R1. And when omega is very, very high, so this term will be higher than this, and we can neglect R1 and R2, so you have the term C1 over C2. So this is what we can call a tunable filter. Why we call it a tunable filter? If you put C1 over C2 to be very low, that's mean that you push this level here, so you will have a, a low pass filter. However, if you put C1 over C2 to be high here and R2 over R1 to be somehow low, you will have a high pass filter. So, herein, you can easily tune 
the characteristics or the transfer curve of your filter by controlling the parameters R1 and R2 and C1 and C2 so that you can adjust your filter to be either a high, a high pass filter or to be a low pass filter based on this combination. That's why we have a DC gain and we have as well a high gain as you can see. So this is the process. And here in, you have one zero and you have one pool. As you can see from this graph, we have a zero and we have a pool. Okay, so another configuration. Let's go to this configuration, which is a R1. R, uh, both are R1, here we have R, and here we have a capacitor, and here we have a V input. This is somehow a bit difficult, uh, difficult configuration. So let's see this. <laughs> so now let's start solving this a bit challenging filter. So let's see. Here are the terminals. Now, this terminal will be no longer connected to the zero. It will be connected to a capacitor, which is C, and here a resistance, which is R. And the input is a common for me, it will be C2. And here we have an R1, and we have R2 as a feedback, and this is the so this is our circuit now. So let's see how we will analyze. Of course, I mentioned that this is somehow a bit challenging with respect to the previous, because simply in the previous circuit, we have the non-inverting imp input grounded, which lead to a virtual ground on the inverting input, which makes life easier, of course. Now we don't have this, of course, the concept of current flowing into the amplifier is still applied, that the current flowing into the amplifier is zero. So simply the voltage in R is, uh, or sorry, the current in R is typically the same as the current in C. And the voltage here and there are the same. So we will call this point the two point Vx. So here we can write two equations. First, we can say concerning the non-inverting node, we can say that the current flowing in R1 is the same as the current flowing in C, or oh, sorry, R, not R1, I'm sorry. The current flowing in R is typically the same as the current flowing in C. This is the first nodal analysis. And going here, we can say that the current flowing in R1 is typically the same current flowing in R2. So let's write equations. So current flowing in R is V1, or V input minus Gx over R equals to Vx because from a, the, the other point is ground, so it's Vx minus zero, Vx over one over J omega C. Or you can write that V input over R equal Vx times, here we will have one over R plus J omega C. Or you can say that Vx equals to 1 over r, as you can say, over 1 over r plus j omega c. As you can see from this equation, of course, times v input. Maybe you can simplify it a bit more and say that. Sorry. <clears throat> You can say that x equals one over one plus j omega r c times. Okay, this is the first equation coming from the assumption that the current flowing in r is typically the current flowing in c. Let's go to the second. The current flowing in r one is typically the same as the current flowing in r two. So we can write. That V input minus Vx over R1 
equals to Vx minus the output over R2. Or you can say that V input over R1 equals V output equal minus V output over R2 minus or not minus plus Vx times 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. If we just here, we need the output in one side and the x in the other side, so we can say that the output over R2, here I will keep this in positive, and then we'll go here in negative equal Vx times 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 minus V input over R1. So we can multiply all the equations times R2 to get the output equal Vx times 1 plus R2 over R1 plus or minus R2 over R1 times V. Now we have a relation for this Vx and V input. So we can say that the output is 1 plus R2 over R1 over 1 plus J omega RC times V input minus R2 over R1 times V input. Or you can make a V input as a common factor. So the output equal V input times 1 plus R2 over R1 over 1 plus J omega RC minus R2 over R1. Okay. So, by making a common denominator across this function, you will get something like that. The output over V input equals 1 minus R2 over R1 J omega RC plus or over 1 plus J omega RC. For a DC gain, omega will, cancel, will be 0, it will turn to 1. So, your DC gain is 1. For a high frequency gain, it will be R2 over R1. So, if you make this R2 over R1 a small value, it will end up a low pass filter. If you increase this R2 over 1 a bit, then you can tune the level of the high frequency component. So, this is another configuration where we can do the same as the previous circuit, but with considering a flat band of one, a one flat band. So, Back to slides here. Back to slides here. As you can see, we have now demonstrated some examples for an active filters, either a low pass filter, a high pass filter, or a tunable low pass, high pass filters. But the main principle across these filters are they are a single order filter. This is simply can be recognized when you recognize the denominator of the transfer function of these filters and you will find a first order denominator on all these stuff. And this is basically can be easily connected to the existence of only one capacitor per, per filter because usually or mathematically at least, the, the source for the omega is C. So you, whenever you have one capacitor, you, you should expect simply one uh, uh, pool or one a first order equation in the, uh, in the denominator. So what will happen? What will happen if we are 
or how we are going to design a high order filter, a second order, a third order, a fourth order filter. In the CMOS technology or in the IC technology, it's quite easy and quite direct to make just such a high order filters by using what we can call a cascading process. In the cascading concept, what we are simply do is we are cascading filters together. So principally, this, let me use annotation for a while. So this one is a direct single order filter. And this one is a direct single order filter. When you cascade these two filters together, you will result up with a second order filter and so on. Of course, this entering stage is just a buffering stage. As you can see, there is no capacitors here. So this first stage will not do any capacitance uh, effect or any filtering effect, let me say so. So the capacitance or the filtering effect will be limited to the second and the third stage. Maybe we are not going to uh, mathematically analyze this because usually the analytical mathematics of this are quite difficult because you have to set a lot of equations and solve these two equations together and uh, uh, make it in a long mathematical way. It is much, much easier to, to discuss this using simulations. That's why it's room for your multi-sem and your cadence classes to solve such uh, uh, high order filters. But I think conceptually you can understand how this will behave as a second order filter or generally how you can make an n order filter by cascading different stages together. By this, I think we have now uh, conducted the first half of our second chapter, dealing with what we can consider a active filter using an operational amplifier, or in other words, we can consider it as a inductorless filters. Now, the time is to go to the second half of the chapter, considering a very important circuit and a very important amplifier in electronics, which is a tuned amplifier. So in the next half, inshallah, we are going to discuss the circuits for a tuned amplifier and how we can design a tuned amplifier. Thank you very much for your concentration and see you in the next lecture, inshallah.